So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar on oxidation management. Uh, today, we are going to talk about this complex topic, and we will go through the entire uh, winemaking process as every step of the winemaking process counts when we are talking about oxygen management. We will be two speakers uh, for this webinar. So Mathieu Boudou, the general manager of Bouchard Vassin North America. Hi, Mathieu. Hi, Eglantine. Uh, thank you, everybody, to be there today. We are really happy to be with you for this uh, webinar about uh, oxidation management. And I will be the second speaker, um, Eglantine Chauffour, winemaking product manager for Boucher Vassin North America, and I'm representing La Motelier. So before we dive in the topic of uh, oxidation management, I would like to introduce you the two partners for this uh, presentation. So we have Boucher Vassin, um, designer, manufacturer of material for grape and wine processing since 1856. So they are very well known and very well um, established in the wine industry all around the world with a lot of experience. And then we have La Motte winemaking product brand, so renowned for their high quality and premium product. They have been established in Bordeaux, France in 1878 so it's about 140 years of expertise and winemaking experience it is now um, present in usa and available for you in north america as uh, boucher vaslan in north america is extending their uh, portfolio and offering a complete solution to winemakers we also have a costral bottling line and caso palms the outline of today we are going to have a half an hour presentation where we are going to focus on the full process of um, winemaking and talk about oxidation management. Uh, as we saw, it is a pretty complex topic uh, that has to be sought in a global way because each step counts and uh, impacts the wine potential, resistance, style, and the final quality product. Then we will have a 10 minutes question and answer uh, discussion where Mathieu and me will be available to answer any question you might have. There is something important to consider is that oxygen can sometimes be uh, beneficial when it's controlled. And most of the time it's detrimental and responsible of many faults, such as premature aging, loss of freshness, loss of balance, loss of varietal aromas, loss of complexity, so loss of identity. Also, it's associated with a color change, so we will have some browning, some loss of color and pinking can happen too. This goes with a loss of polyphenol, so that's why we are losing balance and we are losing structure, complexity, and we are getting a wine that is much more simple with some bitterness and also some oxidized aroma such as a bruised apple, nutty, cooked aromas. So to not have this, it's important to uh, protect and preserve uh, the wine potential through time. And so it's important to understand the oxidation reactions that happen. So the first one that happens on grapes is enzymatic oxidation. These reactions go very fast and the responsible there, the actor there is the PPO, polyphenol oxidase and lacase with oxygen that will oxidize the phenol into a quinone. So these enzymes are present on the, under the skin in the grapes or in the flesh. And basically, as soon as the grapes uh, are open and in contact with oxygen, this reaction is going to happen very, very fast. Then as soon, when we start to have alcohol, so more after fermentation aging, we are talking about chemical reactions. So chemical reactions are actually redox reactions. We have an oxygen that will be activated in a, into a radical via a redox reactions. Uh, so there is usually it's iron or copper that is going to actually uh, exchange electron with oxygen and uh, activate it into a radical. This radical is going to oxidize the phenol into a quinone, plus leading to hydrogen peroxide. This hydrogen peroxide can also be activated via redox reactions into a hydroxyl radical that is a strong oxidant, not very selective. The third one that can happen is microbial uh, oxidation. So here we are mainly talking about the fact that microbes love oxygen. They are going to consume it very, very fast and they are going to develop much more in presence of oxygen, which leads to um, microbial spoilage. So that's another uh, problem, uh, which is pretty common uh, when you have oxygen contact. 
So if we look a little bit more into the two first reactions, um, we can see that they have a common points such as production of a quinone. The quinone is the initiation of the chain reaction of oxidation. So that's the beginning of the oxidation. So let's look at it. So we have a phenol that become a quinone by the activation of oxygen or by the presence of uh, enzymes. This quinone is going to first react with glutathione. Glutathione is a natural antioxidant uh, present in grapes. It's the most common antioxidant present in grapes, and it's a very strong one. It's going to have a very strong affinity with the quinone, and it's going to act as a trap. So the quinone can't move anymore, and the quinone is blocked into this GRP, grape reaction product, and nothing happens. Then, once glutathione is used, quinone is going to react with other phenolic components, which is a phenolic polymerization. That's aging how we know it. Sometimes it can be good when it's controlled to soften the wine and smooth down the structure. But then when you start to lose your phenolic content or get brown, that's not very beneficial anymore. That's actually exactly the same reaction that happen on apple or banana skin. And this happen uh, when you have or chemical when it's very slow, but enzymatic reactions, uh, PPO and phenolic compounds are happening in apple and banana on banana skin and avocado too. Last uh, reaction that can happen is the oxidation of aromas, and that's where we start to lose uh, freshness and varietal character and identity of the wine. In chemical reaction, we have the other step, which is hydrogen peroxide uh, getting oxidized into hydroxyl radical, which is a very strong oxidant, not very selective. So this has, will be a step that we have to control too. So to control uh, these reactions, we can start um, with limiting oxygen contact. If we limit oxygen contact, it's actually a pretty good start, but it's not enough usually. The second uh, strategy will be to remove the precursors of oxidation. So the phenols, this is mainly for white and rosé. In uh, red wine, we want to keep the phenol if possible, uh, since they are part of the structure. So we want to protect them from being oxidized we can think about removing the other precursors, such as inhibiting lacase and PPO, and also uh, removing any residual iron or copper. Then we are going to think about increasing, protecting our own uh, glutathione and increasing the um, concentration of glutathione, so having more uh, natural antioxidant protection and trapping these quinones to stop the reaction. And then we can think about scavenging the radicals. Okay, so think about all these steps. It's uh, very um, important to uh, consider all the steps and not only one, and different options to control oxidation. There is, of course, other uh, parameters that are uh, involved in these reactions, such as the temperature when you're colder, you are actually going much slower, so you can reduce uh, the speed of this reaction. pH as well, at a lower pH, all these reactions are happening slower, so pH is a good way to regulate oxidation reactions. And redox potential, where it's important to control redox potential to not fall into the reductive side or not fall into the oxidative side. Now, let's actually talk about um, while making process and see some tools and practices that you can implement in your cellar to manage oxidation, preserve wine potential and quality. So we're gonna start with grape management. We're focusing on limiting the enzymatic oxidations, which means we are gonna speak about how we can limit the oxygen presence, how we can reduce the precursors present in must, how we can inhibit oxidases, so PPO and lacase, and also we will talk about how we can build up uh, the resistance, the resistant potential, so the oxidation resistance of the wine. So on this, I'm going to actually let Mathieu um, take the hand on the presentation. Mathieu, are you here? Yes, I am. Thank you, Glantine. So I'm going to talk to you about the um, press without oxygen. That's a Bucher Inertis Press, that the patent uh, from 10 years ago um, developed in Bucher uh, industry. So the idea is to press without oxygen. So for white and rosé, you will be sure to preserve the full potential of your grape and to be in charge to manage after the pressing. And as a winemaker, you will have the lead 
to let the oxidation happen or not. So how it works? We have a press, a um, completely sealed press. It's a closed tank. We have also a juice pan completely sealed and connected with different pipes to all the drain channel inside the press. After that, you have a flexible chamber uh, with uh, the neutral gas inside, so you can manage that with nitrogen or carbonic. It's your choice to have uh, one of the other one gas. And um, the gas is without pressure inside the flexible chamber. So at the beginning, we fill the press with wall cluster or with uh, mechanical harvest fruit. We start to put the pressure on the membrane to remove the air inside uh, and outside the press. Also, uh, inside the juice pan, we inject some gas and we let the gas go to the atmosphere to be sure we will remove all the air inside the presses. And after that, we open the connection with the flexible chamber. And at this point, you have the only one connection with the juice is from the neutral gas inside the flexible chamber. And when you are doing the crumbling, all the gas inside the flexible chamber are going inside the juice pan and inside the press. So you are sure all the movements are connected and with the neutral gas. So there is no oxidation. That's the only one system or you are sure to be 100% protected from the oxidation and without air inside the presses. And um, the key is also because it's recyclable, every time the gas is going back to the press or going back to the flexible chamber. And uh, inside the juice pan, you have some uh, level sensor to be sure you will never have uh, air um, going back to the juice pan. And the, everything is automatic and controlled per the press. As you can see on the result, Eglantin told you about glutathione. With the inertis press, because we are connected with the neutral gas and there is no oxidation, you can see on the graph the red one curb it's for the regular press and the green one for the inertis presses. So with the regular presses, all the glutathione um, present in your uh, grape are completely oxidized and consumed. And with the inertis press, we keep a lot of, of this glutathione. We can say without risk, it's 50% of the natural glutathione present in your, in your grape with the inerti system. On the next curve, there is different data for the glutathione. So on the bottom, you can see the red curve. Uh, there is no glutathione on a regular press. And with the purple one, you can see there is a lot of glutathione preserved with the inerti system. You can also see the acid phenol with the um, regular presses, they are completely oxidized. And with the inertia press in blue on the top, you can see we keep the polyphenol. So we will see later how we can manage that, because if the polyphenol are non-oxidized, we need to take care of that with the winemaking solution and with the process inside the press. Regarding uh, the yellow color on the rosé, when you are doing some rosé, you can see on the last curve, uh, the red one, it's inertis, and the green one, it's the regular presses. So we increase the yellow color with the regular presses during the process, from the filling to um, the pressing, because there is oxidation. With inertis, on the left side, you can see during the filling, there is a little bit of yellow color, because uh, that's the free juice from your crusher or from your distemmer and there is a little bit of oxidation. When we start to press and with the injection gas system, we completely reduce the, the yellow color. Does that mean we keep completely the pink color because there is no oxidation? So these data come from the center of Rosé in Provence in France. The first one come from the University of Bordeaux for the white wine. We have some picture, as you can see, the free juice during the pressing are completely green and the pomace at the end of the pressing are completely green too because there is no oxidation. So you can really preserve the potential of your grape again. On the left side, you have two different pictures of juice. The first one on the right side, it's a uh, inertis press is completely green because there is no oxidation. The brown one is from a regular press, huh? a Bucher one too, but not inertis. It's uh, without uh, SO2 and at the end of the press. So because we are um, preserving the oxidation, we keep the glutathione, as I said, but we also keep precursor aromatic. And as you can see, uh, the red one is with inertis, the, the green one, uh, it's a regular press. 
So we preserve between five and 10 times more than uh, the regular one for the tire. So you have all the aromatic precursor preserved in the in our test system and you can manage that uh, later during the process. So we manage that also with a small guide. We edited a small guide uh, to give you different uh, uh, recommendations to manage the process before the pressing and after the pressing because uh, as you can imagine, inertis is just uh, part of the process. And uh, I told you about the polyphenol. Because the polyphenol are non-oxidized, we need to take care of that. So uh, on the presses now, we have all the data uh, available for you and uh, we can uh, manage the press with a conductimeter. So the conductivity is uh, related to the extraction of polyphenol. And as you can see, it's important to reduce the number of crumbling because during the crumbling, you have a lot of oxidation and with inertis there is not, but you also extract some polyphenol. So the main goal is to know when the polyphenols are coming to be sure we can do a juice separation and uh, manage that with different winemaking solutions. So now all the data are available on your computer or on your phone with this type of press and the conductivity is one of the parameters to manage uh, the pressing. We also uh, so a lot of good things about red wine. It was a surprise for us because at the beginning we start to create this press for white and rosé. But some of our customers were using the same presses for white, rosé and red. And they called us to say, hey, you need to taste the wine after pressing because the red pomas are also a lot of sensitive with oxygen. And when you press a pomas with an inertis system, you reduce uh, herbaceous character and you increase the really fresh fruit and red fruit and character in your wine. I mean, you can uh, add a lot of, of your wine press inside the first quality and it's good to have a good uh, return on investment. So the main goal with Inertis is to let you be in control and to control the quantity of oxygen you would like to add in the process. So we have more than 500 references in the world with this system so you can be confident it's working very good thank you mathieu as mathieu said a very important tool and a very important step in the winemaking process to control so if you can actually manage to not have oxidation on the fruit you really preserve great potential and you actually are able to preserve all the work you did in the vineyard for a full year but as we saw, oxygen control is not the only way to protect grape and wine from oxidation. We can also work on reducing the precursors of oxidation, such as the phenolic acid and the enzyme. So here are some tips uh, that you can think about so when you are uh, receiving your grapes. So manage the grape reception, handle your fruit gently, try to limit the mashing. If you limit the machine, you're going to limit the amount of juice that is in contact with oxygen. You're going to limit the lacase extraction or PPO extraction, and you're going to limit the phenolic um, extraction. That's actually a very important point. You can separate the high uh, phenolic content fractions and treat them uh, some in a different way, such as uh, making stronger fining and removing all these precursors. It happens that usually, the end of the press, so the one that are rich in phenolic, are also much with higher pH, so more sensitive to oxidation, and with higher turbidity, so more concentrated into lacase and polyphenol oxidase. And as Mathieu said, we have tools that can help you making the separation. And then we are talking about juice clarification. So why juice clarification is important? It's because enzymes are actually present on the solid part. So if you do clarify, you are going to have a basically less concentration of enzymes in your juice, so a better protection. And you want to limit the oxygen contact, so you want to go as fast as possible. So to do it clean and fast, you need clarification enzyme, such as anosim clar is a very good enzyme for this. Then if you are thinking about removing oxidable and oxidized polyphenols, which means if you did create some quinone until the pressing, it's time to remove them now. So fining agents are highly recommended if you have to remove some oxidation or some oxidable compounds at this step. 
Some people are concerned about fining because they don't want to remove any aromas and they don't want to remove important compounds of the wine. Think that if you have to do a fining, juice phase is actually the best time to do it. You can use bentonite if you want to start thinking about oxidases, but also a protein, so to improve protein stability. And then you can think about casein, PVPP, or P protein if you want to remove uh, phenolic compounds. So if you look at this graph uh, here, we are actually showing how a wine, the, like the aromatic compounds of a wine that has been fine at the juice phase or not. And you can see that the control here as much less thiolic compounds and esters than the one than the juice that we find with green fine, which is our P protein, and then or with casein mix, which is a casein based blend of fining agents. Very important to think about fining in uh, at juice stage. That's where you can actually correct any mistake and prepare your juice to ferment properly and then your wine to age properly. So you're increasing the aging potential of your wine by removing the precursors of oxidation. So we can also work on inhibiting uh, the oxidase activities. So there is two options to inhibit oxidase activity, SO2 and sacrificial tannins. It happened that SO2 is not very efficient against lacase, while protanin R, which is our uh, Lamotabier tannins that we selected to react strongly with protein, has a very strong effect on inhibiting lacase and PPO. So very good antioxidasic protection. As you can see in this graph here, the purple curve is the protanin R, and we are looking at how much of the tannin you need to completely reduce the activity of the lacase. And you see that protanin R is the most efficient comparing to all the other tannins. It is a pure uh, pro anthocyanidic tannin, uh, that has a high affinity with proteins, so strong antioxidasic effect. It also improves clarification. It is going to be a radical scavenger, so it's going to protect uh, the wine a little bit from oxidation on this side. But mainly and mostly, it's going to help color stabilization in red wines. We use it at harvest on grapes, and then the dosage, this is more for red wines, 20 to 50 grams per hectoliters. On white or rosé, we are really on the low end of this dosage. So if we want to look at some uh, trial result, actually, you have the picture of a wine that the control that is a slight red, almost pink, while when we add 10 grams per hectoliters of protein R, you can see the increase of intensity and strength of the color, but even more with 20 grams per hectoliters of protein R has a very strong impact on protecting basically sacrificing himself towards protein and oxidation to protect the natural phenolic compounds from the grapes and maintain the color. As you can see in this trial here, we are showing the color intensity and you can see that the protein R, R is helping increasing mainly the red part of the, um, of the color, so that's very important. And then we realize that if you do a fraction addition, it works even better. So you can add it like half at a crash and half at inoculation, and you will have an intensified effect color protection. Here, same result. You can see that we increase a lot the purple and the red part by using protein R at inoculation, at a, sorry, at crash, but also the amount of phenolic compounds. Tan protein R is going to react with the protein and precipitate. So all the tannins that we are increasing here are actually all the tannins that we saved from our grapes. So very good approach on red wine in with any situation on white and rosé. We recommend protein R when you do have some botrytis. Then the last step on the grape processing is to actually increase the wine resistance potential. So we saw how to protect the natural glutathione present in the grapes. We can actually enhance. So there are some grapes that could be uh, not as rich as other with glutathione. That's actually some grape variety are more sensitive to oxidation because of their lack of glutathione. So even when you protect everything, it's always good to think about enhancing the concentration. If you look at this graph, you can see that the green uh, line here is representing how fast the glutathione can consume oxygen and if you look at the 
blue line, this is how fast free SO2 is consuming oxygen. So this graph is mainly to show you glutathion is reacting very fast with oxygen and it is a very strong antioxidant. So how do we bring uh, up the concentration of glutathione in wines? We have to use yeast derivatives that are rich in sulfur peptides. So optithiol is our uh, Lamotabie yeast uh, nutrients that will increase your concentration of cysteine and glutathione. So increase the concentration of sulfur peptides in your wine. So some of them will be used to produce more thiols and some of them are actually used to reinforce antioxidant uh, protection of the wine. We use it pre-inoculation, 15 to 30 grams per hectoliters. Here you can see a result of trials. You can see that we are increasing a lot the production of tiles, but also the residual tiles in the wine. This difference is kept even nine months after aging because you have a more, much more higher resistance to oxidation in your wine. So now we are ready with our juice. Everything is protected. Everything is on enriched. We preserve our potential. We arrive to fermentation. That's the step where we don't have to worry about oxidation. Actually, we, all, we want oxygen present during fermentation. Yeast needs oxygen and yeast likes oxygen. They are going to consume it faster than the must. So you have no worry to have about this. But also, they need it to produce sterile and unsaturated fatty acids that are responsible for the fluidity of the membrane and resistance of the yeast to stress. So with oxygen, the yeast will be having a stronger resistance, so a healthier fermentation will happen and cleaner fermentation too. In addition to this, oxygen can be used to produce some ethanol and so you can use this ethanol to do condensation between uh, anthocyanin and tannins and improve color stability in red wines. And then oxygen is going to help you regulate your redox potential. During fermentation, is gonna completely uh, put the redox potential down. So it's gonna be very, very low, which uh, can also induce some production of H2S and red active aromas. So it is important to regulate your redox potential and bringing oxygen will help you to do this. Let's talk about the rest of the process and let's talk about wine aging and bottling where we are mainly focused on chemical oxidation, since as soon as there is alcohol, the enzymatic oxidation is not really the main one. Since we worked very good on the first step of the process in preserving the grape potential, removing precursors of oxidation and building up resistance of the wine, we don't have much to do anymore. We just have to focus on protecting and stabilizing the wine and just not screw up everything you did before. So to this, I just want to review very quickly the chemical oxidation uh, reactions and where we can play during aging through bottling. So the first step that is the most important now is to uh, control dissolved oxygen. To control dissolved oxygen, we will work on very on good uh, cellar practices. Second step is to use antioxidants. So we can use antioxidants that will scavenge radicals, some antioxidants that will consume the dissolved oxygen before the wine component consume it. So for this, we are talking about free sulfur. We are talking about grape tannins that will consume uh, oxygen, like will basically reinforce your antioxidant properties. So Vinitan Advance is our grape tannin that we recommend for this application. Tannescence volume is our tannins coming from oak. It's a 100% untoasted oak. Very good radical scavenger, but also very good to regulate redox potential and stabilize it. And then lees. So before you age on lees, please make sure you think about tasting your lees. Lees can be very good in uh, antioxidant protection, but lees can also increase your um, reductive of flavor if they are very reductive or increase the risk of microbial contamination if you do have contamination in the lees. So please taste the lees before you do anything. Next step is to, again, reinforce uh, glutathione. So uh, you can still use some uh, yeast derivative rich in sulfur peptides, such as optithiol or Aroma Protect at this step. Much better to do it upfront on juice. You can still use fining agent to remove your precursors of oxidation with removing your phenols. 
removing your uh, metals or your activators of oxygen. Conclusion on this, we need to limit dissolved oxygen. We need to use antioxidants with SO2, we need an advance, and finally, we need to increase wine oxidation resistance with optithiol or aroma protect. We can stabilize redox potential. It's good to do in any type of wine through the entire uh, aging and bottling process with tan essence volume. And then you can remove precursors of oxidation with findings. If we look at this limiting dissolved oxygen, and we have to focus on cellar practices. So how do we do this? The first thing is to measure DO. Then you want to sparge in line with nitrogen for transfer and use a qualitative pump. I say this because look at the table on the side. If you look at it closely, and these numbers are actually on the lower average, but you can see how much dissolved oxygen we can have after a cell action. And so if you do have a very wrong pump, any pump in here can go up to a saturation. If you don't tight your um, hoses properly, if you have a leak in your clams, if you don't inert your tank before, if you don't inert your hoses before, you will reach a saturation to every each of these steps. But having a qualitative pump is a key. You need good equipment, you need clean equipment, and you need equipment that are properly sealed to uh, make sure you can ensure no pickup of oxygen. You can limit headspace, so that's mainly if you are uh, aging in um, tanks. Uh, when you are aging in barrel, you are trying to make a topping regularly. That's okay. So if you do age in tanks, you want to use CO2 or argon for headspace. Your topping schedule has to be uh, properly sought. And then you have to think about alternative to cold stabilization. If you look at this table, the steps that dissolve the most oxygen is actually cold stabilization. The reason is that we put the wine very cold, so oxygen is easier. It's easier for the oxygen to be dissolved in cold temperature. Then we are filtering the wine cold, we are pumping the wine cold, and then we warm it up for bottling. So that's a very important very, uh, step. There is alternatives now that exist that are actually not subtractive methods, but additive methods. So you can use manoprotein, Arabic gum, or CMC. Uh, that will be a um, very good approach of cold stabilization because in addition to having a lower cost of production, faster process, less labor, less energy, you also uh, don't lose volume and don't lose quality. So there is a lot of positive advantage of using alternative to cold stabilization. Mainly the negative one is that you have to test it because it doesn't work in every single wine and you have to find the right dosage. So Mathieu, I'm going to actually uh, let you talk about uh, the pump because I think it's a very important point to work with good equipment here. Yeah, thank you Eglantine. And as you said, there is different step when you are producing wine. And all the steps are really important uh, for the um, oxygen management. So uh, we have a caso pump. It's a lobular pump made of food grade R nitrile rubber. And uh, good things with this pump, it's uh, a sealed pump. So there is a very low oxygen dissolution. And because it's a sealed pump, you can use this pump from the crusher to the bottling line on all the different steps. And you will have a very low oxygen dissolution during the process. So this pump is really interesting. We have a lot of features on it available. We have different process switch to manage the barrel filling. You can also uh, remove the pump mass with this pump, again, because we can pump solids. And uh, we have a wireless remote control. So, and you can sanitize the pump. It's also really important to be in capacity to sanitize at a high level of temperature. So it's 194 um, degrees Fahrenheit to sanitize the pump and um, it's important for the oxidation. So if you have more questions, I can answer to you later about that. Thank you, Eglanti. Okay, so thank you, Mathieu. Uh, bottling and closure um, options where it is the last risky step in the winemaking process. So if you work all good all the way, a pickup of oxygen at bottling time is gonna completely ruin your wine so that's where you have to be focused and concerned until the end because any mistake at this step is gonna be uh, completely um, detrimental and it will change completely the final product you have you give to your consumer 
bottle shock is a term that people use to basically find an excuse and not say, oh, I make a mistake. I had dissolved oxygen in my bottle, but just say, no, this is bottle shock. If you work properly and you don't have any pickup of oxygen during bottling, you don't have any bottle shock. But if you do have dissolved oxygen and if you have a pickup of oxygen, you're going to lose free sulfur. So you're not going to be protected against oxidation unless you work very, very good and you have still some glutathione remaining uh, to help you as antioxidant. But then you're going to turn on in browning, pinking uh, issues happen at bottling time also uh, with a pickup of oxygen. Then we arrive to all the description that we talked about before, loss of aromas, freshness, balance. Uh, wines are just unpleasant and losing quality. That's premature aging. But the other risk is since you lose free sulfur and things that one milligram per liter of oxygen is going to consume uh, about four milligram per liter of sulfur. So you, you can have a very big decrease of sulfur. So you don't have antimicrobial effect anymore. And so you can have microbial development and spoilage. So what to do uh, is to measure dissolved oxygen before, during, and after bottling. There is many uh, tools that exist to measure, di measure dissolved oxygen. And I hope uh, each of one that are on this uh, webinar has one because that's a very useful tool to have. And then, use a nitrogen spar sparging. So at this step, we don't really want to sparge with CO2 because CO2 is actually going to be dissolved in the wine. And so you are going to change the full balance uh, of your wine and you are going to make it a little bit more um, sparkling or gassy, let's say. But um, nitrogen is a very good gas to use at this step. So sparge the line, inert the filler bowl, inert the um, bottles, make sure your bottling line has at least a gas flashing or vacuum um, integrated in the bottling line. Any increase of uh, higher than 0.2 ppm of dissolved oxygen means that there is an excessive pickup on the line. So you should be very low. And then since you control this, you can choose your closure. Um, you can choose the OTR of your closure, which means that you choose the permeability to oxygen and how much oxygen your wine is going to see at which speed through the bottle aging process. So that's a choice that you can make. It's a controlled oxidation and it's uh, the normal process of aging. You have to speak with different suppliers of closure and see the different option, but know that each, uh, it's very important to choose the right one adapted to your wine style to not get premature aging, but to also not get too reductive. So if we want to make a conclusion, uh, oxidation protection, it has to be sought through the entire process of winemaking. It's a full process concern, or every step counts and every step matters. On grapes, we are trying to protect against enzymatic oxidation and preserve all our potential. So for this, we limit oxygen contact. Using an inert press, such as inertis, is actually uh, the way to go. And then you can inhibit the lacase activity with sulfur and uh, protein R. Think about separating the press fraction, and to this press fraction, we can work with fining. Clarification is uh, very important to clean your juice clean it from lacase and PPO, clean it from phenolic compounds, but also prepare for a clean and healthy fermentation. And then you can think about enhancing your glutathione content with optithiol. As soon as fermentation is finished, we want to uh, preserve and stabilize our wine so you can stabilize your redox potential or increase the buffer capacity of your wine regarding oxidation, to take oxidation with tannicense volume. Vinit and advance and lease aging will be good antioxidant protection, free sulfur as well, just maintain a, a good amount of free sulfur, usually 30 to 35 uh, milligram per liter is enough in free as oxidation uh, protection, not always as microbial protection, that's molecular sulfur. Measure your DO and use inert gas in any uh, transfer you do, use good equipment, good cellar practices are the most important point at this step. And when we are talking about uh, stabilization, think about alternative to cold. So 
Arabic gum, CMC, or monoprotein are options. In red wines, we are using inert gas. We limit the mashing, and then mainly we focus on antioxidasic protection. So sulfur and protanin R are important at this step. During fermentation, we just want to have a color stabilization. Pressing, Mathieu showed you that pressing with inertis uh, red wines are actually very beneficial. It shows much more advantage than we were actually expecting. So it's a very good news and you can use the same press for your white, rosé and red. During aging, we are on the same topic, stabilize your redox potential, increase the buffer capacity of your wine to resist accept oxidation and to just resist to it. So um, tan essence volume, vinit and advance, lease aging if they are clean, free SO2, and then good equipment, good cellar practices. To stabilize color and tartrate, you can think about Arabic gum and manoprotein. I would like to thank you very much and thank you Mathieu also for uh, your participation to this webinar. Mathieu and me stay available for any question if you have any question, but also if you want more information of any of these products, please go on BV North America. You will find everything. We have everything available for all the North America here in stock in California. So feel free to visit the website and ask us any question you have. If you want to review the webinar, it's going to be on our chan YouTube channel as the previous webinars. So thank you very much.